Hey y'all, I'm James Wright. Welcome to my shop and today we're going to take a look at sharpening a rip saw. Let's dive in. Rip saws come in many different forms, whether it's the large hand saw or the tenon saw or even the dovetail saw, they all have rip teeth. Now you can get them with hybrid or some other cut, but if you're intending to rip down the board, you use a rip saw. If you're going across the board, then you're using a cross cut saw. If you want to know the difference between a rip saw and a cross cut saw, I've got a whole video on that. So I'm not going to go into that very deeply, but today I want to particularly look at sharpening a rip saw. We'll have a video in the future on sharpening a cross cut saw. Today I'm going to be sharpening this hand saw. It's a hand saw because it's longer than 26 inches. To do the sharpening you need a way to hold it in place. So a saw vise is a great thing to have and you're also going to need a triangular file. I'm also going to be using this Vertus sharpening guide. I like it to go on the other end. It gives me a good visual reference of where my file is. The triangular file itself is, well, it's a triangle, except for it's not. The very edge, the tip, is slightly rounded or even flat. Sometimes they're called a six-sided file because it's a slightly flat side. And that way you don't have a sharp gullet at the bottom of the tooth. It has a little bit of a wear, so it's not going to tear out on you. When you're first getting started, just go to the big box store and get a triangular file. It doesn't need to be a high-quality one. It will work just fine. The difference between a high-quality file and a cheap one is the cheap ones wear out very quickly, whereas the high-quality files will last you a good while. I'm also not going to be talking about saw setting. That's a whole nother step and it's something that I only do every four to six sharpenings. It's not something you have to do every single sharpening. And I have a whole video coming up on that in the future as well. So I'm going to use this saw vise. It's one that I made and I've got plans available on my website as well as a video if you would like to build one yourself. The nice thing about this is it provides its own clamping strength but then I can also add to that with the clamping strength of the vise that it's in as well and I can really get it tight. The tighter you get it, the less vibration you feel. So it's nice to have something that's, that's good and solid on there. But if you don't have one of these, you could just get two sticks, clamp them together, and put them in your vise. Paul Sellers has a fantastic video on ripping a slot and a simple stick. It goes in there great. I like to get it up a little bit higher, closer, and easier to see. And it's also less chance that my file is going to be digging into the bench top as it would be so close down there. Next, I need to look at which triangular file I want to use. And they're all by size. Basically, how big is the triangle on there? And you're going to see all these little ones of needle file and uh, two times slim, slim, a slim seven inch, a regular, and they're all going to be all these sizes and names and don't get bent out about the names. You'll hear some saw sharpening gurus will tell you, oh, you've got to use the two times slim for this particular tooth size. And that's good information to go by. But a lot of times the cheap ones, you're not going to actually get a name on there. You're just going to say oh, it's a triangular file. So let me show you the easy way to figure it out. I'm going to get you in really close in this tooth right here. I'm going to take my file and I'm going to set it into that gullet and push it down until it fits the shape. And you notice here, the tooth is actually coming up past halfway on the face of the file here. If the tip of the tooth goes past halfway on the face of the file, that means that face, next time you rotate it, you're going to be wearing out the middle of the file twice as fast as the rest of the file. And you don't want to do that because the middle of the file is what's actually cutting the very tip of the tooth, what's doing the cutting. So you want to make sure when you put the file in there and you can see on this one, it's getting close to the middle of the tooth. Or I can go up to one of these big honkers, put that in there, and you can see that's nowhere near the middle of the tooth. So I can use this big one to go in there and it won't hit the middle of the file at all. But the big one has bigger roundovers on the corner. So what I'm looking for is a file that when I put it in there, it's just a little ways away from the middle. That's the exact size you want to use. Also be warned, some saws have progressive teeth. The last few inches will have smaller teeth and back here they'll have bigger teeth. So you actually want to grab the file and test it back here on the big teeth to make sure it'll fit. Another question that I get way more than I want to is how do I know when my saw is dull? Well, you know it's dull when it's not cutting the way it should cut. But if you're new to this and you don't know how that should be, what you want to do is come back here close to where the handle is and feel the last couple teeth here. And then come up right on the toe, the last few teeth there, and feel those ones. And then come into the middle and feel those. If there's a big difference between these teeth and these teeth, that means these ones are worn out. You rarely use the last couple teeth or the first couple teeth, so those, those stay fairly sharp. The first thing I want to do is grab a mill file, a fine or medium mill file. It doesn't need to be anything special. I just want to go from the handle towards the teeth, and I want to hold it 90 degrees to the plate and slide it along. And I want to go until I see a shiny spot on the top of every tooth. So right here, you can see this one is a nice shiny spot. And this one doesn't have much shiny at all. And then again, a shiny spot here. 
and looking at them, it's, it's kind of hard to see on the camera here, but I want to go and tell every tooth has this little flat spot on it. That lets me know that every tooth is the same height. So after one pass, there's probably about a half dozen teeth that aren't all the way out. And so I'm just going to do one more pass. And after that one, we've got a nice shiny spot on every tooth. You'll see shiny spot, shiny spot, shiny spot. Oh, uh, actually, that one is actually an old broken tooth. Um, so we're hopefully getting that back into filing, probably in the next sharpening, not this one. But every other tooth has a nice shiny spot on it. The reason you get all the teeth perfectly jointed and level is you want every tooth contacting the work as it cuts. If there's one that's up higher, that tooth isn't going to be doing anything for you. And that means that there's one tooth that's not cutting. Or if you have one that's sticking out a long ways, when that one gets to the wood, it digs in and your saw stops. And you may find occasionally you'll be sawing along and there's one point in the saw which it always kind of jams on you. It's probably because there's one tooth that's sticking up a little bit higher than the others around it. Next, we need to figure out the geometry. At what angle are we going to rake the file? Raking is rolling it forward and backward. Rip teeth, though, are very, very easy because there's no fleam at all. That means the file needs to be 90 degrees to the plate. So we just need to worry about what rake is it at. The nice thing is you can just put it in the teeth and see that it used to be right there. And that's what we're going to keep it at. And so I like to set my Veritas jig so that this cross arm is level with the teeth. And now I can visualize with this cross arm and make sure every saw stroke, I'm keeping it level and I'm not rotating it one way or the other. So now when sharpening, I want to push the file straight down. I don't want to push it into the tooth in front or the tooth in back. I want the file to go vertically directly down into the floor. I'm going to do one pass and see if I've gotten rid of that flat spot. And just like that, the flat spot on that one's gone. So then I can move back one. And the flat spot on that one's gone. I can move back one. And we can just progress along here, every time looking at that flat spot, making sure it disappears. If it's been recently sharpened, it's usually only going to take one or two passes. In this case, most of them are about one pass. Sometimes I find it worthwhile to have a light on the opposite side at 45 degrees from where I'm at. So the light bounces off that shiny spot and back up at me. That makes it much easier to see that shiny spot. The other answer some people do is take a Sharpie and just run right along the tips of all of them. Until... They all have that shiny spot covered up. In that case, you're just going until the Sharpie disappears. You can get a little idea. Most of these are only about one pass each. Sometimes I have to come back and do a half pass. And then you work from one end to the other and just keep going. And just like that, we're done. The actual sharpening on this one only takes about three or four minutes. It's pretty quick because they're big teeth, they're easy to see, and that's why I pick it for the camera because then you can see them. It's gonna be the exact same process for something small like a dovetail, but this has way more teeth than this does even though it's so much smaller. And because they're smaller, they take more time to visualize and you need a smaller file. And this takes a lot longer than this. Dovetail is usually gonna take me somewhere around 20 minutes to sharpen, whereas this goes really, really quickly. At this point, there's a small subset of viewers who are yelling at the screen right now that I did all of them from the same direction. And honestly, when I first got started, I would switch it. Every other tooth, I would do every other direction. So I'd do half of them one way, then I'd turn the saw around and I'd do the other half from the other side. And that means that you get an even burr pushing off on either side. Because as I file it this way, I'm pushing a burr off on this side. So on all of these teeth, there's a small burr sticking out over here. And that mentally should make a big difference. But in practice, after two or three strokes through the wood, that burr has rubbed off and there's no difference at all. Or if it does stick around, then I just take my finest stone and do one smooth pass down the side and stone the saw and it's done. I find it much, much easier and faster to do it all from one side than ba back and forth. I used to do it back and forth and, and then I got smarter and just did it the easy way. And now we can take it out of the saw vise and take it for a test drive and see how well it does. What I'm looking for is does it veer off one direction or the other? And that let me know that the set is currently off on it. Now I didn't go and set the saw. I only do that every four or five because I'm only taking off a small amount. And that means every time I sharpen it, the set is going to get a little bit smaller. But the problem is every time you set the teeth, you're weakening them a little bit and that can cause problems. So I prefer to only do it every four or five times. 
first two cuts are tracking right about the way I want it to. Can I cut down the middle? Let's find out. I'd say that's acceptable. Yeah, it's more than acceptable. I'll take it. Nice, straight, clean cuts, nothing binding, and I can go right down the middle like that. For a big, beefy handsaw, that's what I'm looking for. If you do find the saw is veering off course, then you can take a little bit of set off the side it's turning to. So if it's turning this way, I want to take some set off of this side of the teeth. If it's turning this way, I want to take some set off of this side of the teeth. So the side it's turning on, that means that side's being more aggressive. And you can take that off by just grabbing a stone and sliding it down one or two times, and it's amazing how quickly it takes it off. If you want to see more on that, I've got a whole video on how to stone a saw. Uh, it's a really quick and easy video, too. Now, as with anything in the hand tool world, there are a bunch of other things and other ways you can do it. And every time you see a video of someone teaching saw sharpening, they're going to show different little things in there. Some people like to come in with a really fine file and hit the backs of all the teeth. I found that to be a little bit overkill and it doesn't really cause that big a difference, but some people really like that. So try it out for yourself and see what you like. Even if you go back and watch my old videos on how to sharpen a rip saw, I'm going to talk about different things that I do at different times. I change up my form as I try new things and I see what works for me and what really doesn't make that big a difference. So I can see what way I can get back to actually cutting some lumber quick and easily. I'll also link to some of my old saw sharpening videos if you want to see those as well. It's one of those skills that it'll take you a few times to really get it down, but for the most part, you're not going to make the saw any worse than it already is. So don't be afraid to get out there and have some fun with it. But as a word to the wise, don't go to the big box store and buy a hard tooth saw. Any saw you get from the big box store is going to be hard teeth. Uh, number one, they're all cross cut. And number two, uh, they're hardened teeth. So you're actually going to end up just destroying your files. So um, don't, don't practice on these. If you want to practice on one, you can go get an old one relatively affordably and have some fun with it and just practice. It doesn't take that much to get the skill down. Or there are some practice kits or you can get a card scraper or any particular type of spring steel and have some fun. It's not a really hard skill and most people can get it down in two or three times of actually trying it. And it's great to have a saw that, oh, I know when it's sharp and when it's not, and when it's not sharp, I can take it back over. Ten minutes later, it's sharp and ready to go and saves me so much time and it's so much more fun to use because a good sharp saw is actually really enjoyable. You can let the saw do its work and it does it well. If it's dull, it won't do the work and so you can't let it do the work and you have to force it. And that means you've got to put more body weight into it and that means you're going to be kinking it. That means it's going to be going off the line and dull saws are no fun. So stay sharp. I hope you like this video. If you have any questions, thoughts, ideas, snide remarks, things I did wrong, things I did right, let me know down below. I love reading through those. I do learn a lot from that, and it helps me as well as helps out the channel. So thank you. Anytime you put a comment, the like, share, subscribe, all those buttons down there. Thank you. Helps us get in front of more people, helps the channel grow, and really means a lot. And there's a bunch of people who just put comment down below, down below. Thank you. Or you could be an amazing person. One of these beautiful, gorgeous, benevolent people over on Patreon. All these names over here, those are some of the, the patrons on Patreon. Because without patrons or members, people who support this channel, we wouldn't be here. We are completely sponsored by you. So thank you. If you'd like to help out with that, you know what to do. Links down below. <laughs> I think that'll do it for now. And until next time, have a wonderful day. This is a video you can bookmark and, and save for later. I, I guess you could say you could file this one away.